much. Um, we have on my far left here, Stephen Wang, who is the CEO and co-founder of Realism, an ed tech company. He went to high school in uh, Metro Detroit and then moved here recently in the last year. Um, and so next to him we have uh, Evelyn Reyes, a student in Boston Public Schools. Uh, and then here to my right we have Carla Duran Capellan. Um, so she graduated from Lowell High School and is now at Middlesex Community College. So um, I have some questions for them. About 10 minutes before we end, I'm going to try and open it up and see if we can get some questions from you, if there are things that you want to hear that we haven't talked about yet. Uh, so we'll just get started. Um, so first, uh, you know, along the, the, the subject of the panel, how high school should change, I'm just going to give each of them a chance to talk about um, things that they would, they, how they think traditional high school uh, should be different. So thank you. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Evelyn. And in terms of how I think traditional high school should change, there are a lot of students who have like a very focused view of like what they want out of high school and their high schools usually or a lot of high schools can't actually offer exactly what they're looking for and I think that's one of the issues that we have is that there aren't enough like specialized courses there're not enough specific classes that students can go and seek out and say like I want to take this class cuz I want to learn about this like let's go here and do that um, there are opportunities like dual enrollment, which do offer some of those like specialized courses, but don't, those aren't as available as you would think, and they also fill up very, very quickly. Um, and another thing that I see at my own school is that a lot of people, we have two pathways at my school. Like you can choose to take certain classes, and, and it's called the pathway. Um, and we don't. Normalized, so a lot of students will take a standard curriculum and then not get to take um, their standard curriculum where in my school you can. So I think there needs to be a balance between how or how much access students have to like those specialized classes and then looking at those like pathways that they can take. Yeah, definitely. I definitely agree there. Um, for me, the biggest area is definitely course selection. Uh, are always going to be there, uh, reading, writing, math, science, but what we need to improve on is adding courses. And for me, this carries into two main areas. One is the support of students in development of more core skills that are critical in an increasingly complex workforce in the future. And second is the development of a student's passion. And the biggest case right now that uh, a lot of people are probably very familiar with is with computer science. Uh, Technology is getting to the point where it's not a superfluous add-on anymore to a curriculum. It's basically that all are going to need to have um, in any workplace in the future. And it's scary that only 35% of U.S. high schools currently have computer science courses. Um, even though a lot of states are doing much better recently, passing a lot of legislation and improving on that, there's still a lot more room for and then there are questions like, what about financial literacy? Uh, we're teaching our students algebra, calculus, but are we teaching them how to read their income statements so they know how to uh, project interest rates on their loans for the futures? I think these are all really important questions uh, to consider and core skills that we should help students develop um, that they're actually going to need uh, and use when they're full-grown adults in the workplace. helping students develop their passions in high school. Um, I actually dropped out of high school uh, right before my senior year to fully commit to realism right now. I'm working on realism full time and absolutely love it. Moved out from Detroit to Boston. Uh, but a lot of my career has been self-study. Uh, I went to a great school, great classes in the core academics, but there weren't any chances for me to develop beyond there in my interests, like in business programming and robotics. So I had to learn a lot of that online on my own. But if there were core classes within school that would help me develop those passions, that would have probably convinced me to stay in school. And the fact is, uh, a recent study by Ernst and Young found that 91% of high school students already know what they want to do in their future. So it's not too early to help students unleash their potential and start in high school. What about you, Carla? I would say that um, in my end, what is missing from the curriculum is flexibility. And flexibility in a sense that, for example, in my 
uh, perspective and my experience, I got placed in ELL classes, which is like the assumption of limiting my ability of learning, my ability of going above and beyond uh, different classes or a different, a different form of curriculum that usually us immigrants or people who have English as their second language um, wouldn't, for the system, wouldn't understand. And I think that um, because the curriculum kind of like give us a test and places in these classes, they kind of give us a label of like, you are going through this path. And we're not allowed to go one way or the other unless you finish this path. And we, we think as the, as the curriculum that you are over this. So I think that uh, one thing would be flexibility. So we have three students here that are doing a lot in their own schools and in their communities to um, impact what happens. experience more generally through this position? So through my work on the school committee, well, currently it's budget season, right? So we are just about to achieve the budget, or the projected budget for FY2020. Um, and through looking at that, my one of my responsibilities is sort of to look over which schools are getting what money and for what, and what grants are going to which schools. And part of that is that a lot of our schools are being underfunded. And chronically underfunded every year is another problem. And the first thing to go is technology. And that, that's what particularly the ones that either don't have technology to begin with and are still getting like undercut, um, and also the ones who are having to cut their programs because their students won't, you know, they won't get that experience anymore. Um, another one of the things that BSAC, which is the group that I'm a part of, the Boston Student Advisory Council, is working towards is changing the, um, the cell policy, the cell phone policy within schools, because we see that cell phones are being used in the classroom as a tool. Um, and there's something that we have, we have a student rights app, it's a web-based app, and we are trying to promote that, and it's actually something that helps students advocate for themselves when they get uh, wrongfully suspended or into trouble. And that cell phone policy is, is prohibiting them from knowing their rights. So we are trying to remove that cell phone policy and get technology that students already have access to like on their own, like through their personal lives, into classrooms. Question. So you're talking about um, trying to figure out ways to increase student access to technology. Can you talk about why you think that's a good idea? What is the value of technology in classrooms in your experience? Um, I'm actually going to echo something that Stephen said, and I think she's completely right in saying it, that technology is becoming like basic literacy for all of us, um, the students who are in school right now and those that are coming behind us. Um, Technology is just something that we have to be fluent in in order to make it into the workforce once we get out of school. Um, and also, there are other ways to learn, and there are other, you know, there are countless resources online that teachers can use to help their students look at things through a different way or to help their students really expand what they're looking into as they're learning about the world. Um, so Stephen, talk about what you're trying to do with your company and um, how you hope that might impact students' high school experiences if their, student, if their schools adopt it. Yeah, great. So I'll start off by giving you guys just a quick rundown of what we do. So our uh, Reels and VR at Tech Company, and we create virtual science labs that give students access to resources that they would never have mm -hmm. gotten inside the real classroom due to cost and safety restrictions. Um, and you know, take you guys through our mission, actually. This is kind of personal. So uh, my co-founder, Andre, is originally from Detroit Public Schools, and I'm from the Metro Detroit area. So we personally witnessed uh, the complete fallout of the Detroit Public School system, lack of funding, teacher strikes, uh, buildings uh, being broken down 24-7. And this caused a huge disparity in the student's education. And where it was most apparent was in science education. This is because science is one of the most resource intensive uh, components of education due to the amount of uh, time that students need to spend in applying the knowledge they've learned and hands-on experiences uh, with science labs. Uh, they learn a lot from the textbooks and the lectures, but 
the actual usage is when they're actually applying that knowledge and synthesizing it in an experience, like mixing two chemicals together. And seeing that explosion is the real magic of science and where education should be going. Uh, but that disparity uh, is huge across students that have access to those resources. And uh, not only Detroit Public Schools is like that and has is being underfunded, there are millions of students across the world that don't have access to these resources that they need to get a complete science education. So this is where uh, our mission of realism comes in. Uh, our mission is to bring students, uh, no matter their socioeconomic background, status, or location, access to hands-on, real-world science education that they can get anytime, anywhere. And from this mission, we synthesize two main goals. Uh, first is that we want to level the playing field, provide any student, and especially underprivileged students, access to these high-level resources that other students are getting and through our virtual lab platform that they can access right through their laptop or virtual reality they can get these high level labs um, for example one of our labs is the chemistry lab where students can assemble hundreds of different chemicals together and get thousands of different reactions just as they would in real life they can see the chemicals coming together put three together they can visualize the explosions just from their laptop or from a virtual reality headset and the second goal is to bring the impossible to all students. And that kind of references what I was talking about earlier with uh, the problems of cost restrictions and safety restrictions. Uh, in virtual reality and in a 3D simulation, all those are bypassed. And you can basically help students fully unleash their creativity. And one of the examples of our labs is our rocket lab, where a student is positioned as a NASA engineer. And they need to use their chemistry knowledge and assemble a rocket put in the fuel and launch it successfully to the moon. And that is an example of one of the things that we can do in virtual reality. The really crazy stuff that students read about in textbooks but never get to do. And today we can bring that to the classroom. And so Kadla, can you talk about through your activism, what kind of things are you trying to change about the current high school experience? Um, for example, um, I came back to my high school, and now I co-teach with my old history teacher. And as Evelyn was saying, the phones are being used most than ever in classrooms now. And one of the tools that we use is uh, this app called Remind, where the teacher can communicate with the students and their parents in, the, in their um, native language. So for example, most of my students uh, come from uh, Latin America, and most of them come from Iraq. And most of them are refugees. So what she does is that she connects with the parents if they have any questions or anything like that. And she can type it on the computer in English and it will send the message to their parent in their native language. And uh, from my experience in the open houses when the parents come to the classroom and talk to the teacher, the first thing they say is that, I love when you send me text messages about my daughter or my son doing something great in the classroom. And I can understand it. And if I answer you back, you will get it in English, even though I'm not texting you in English. And that's the best experience ever, having that a parent tell you, I can communicate. Finally, I can communicate with you. And I, I think that's uh, one of the highlights that I can take from uh, high school and technology together. So let's talk about assessments. Steven, you have specifically talked about the value of performance-based assessments over standardized, you know, the multiple choice standardized tests. Can you talk a bit more about where you think that should fit into high school and why? Yeah, definitely. To start off, uh, performance-based assessments to me is the future of assessments. Um, taking a look at multiple choice today, which is still the status quo, look at the ACT, SAT. Another way of looking at that is basically rote memorization. And that worked well 100 years ago when it was first introduced. Uh, most people only needed a rudimentary education, as most people around the world were preparing for jobs in factories and large-scale distribution lines where they are pretty much doing the same thing every single day. But nowadays, with the rise of automation and all these jobs getting replaced, it's in increasingly important that students have these advanced uh, skills like problem solving, creativity, and adaptivity um, going into the future workforce that are going to be essential to solve the problems of the future. Uh, and uh, from this performance-based uh, assessments, um, it's something that's actually analogous to our era. It can help students bring out the 
true skills that they need. And through performance-based assessments, um, the core thing is problem solving. And when you actually put a performance-based assessment in front of a student, instead of a rote memorization, multiple choice test, when they're just circling A, B, C, D, they actually have to synthesize the knowledge that they've been using and they've been learning from the different classes and put it all together in an effective way. I think that's the true magic of performance-based assessments. It brings out the knowledge within the student instead of just ha having them regurgitate it. Uh, but there's, performance-based assessment is also hard. Uh, teachers can write multiple choice tests much easier than creating a performance-based assessment as performance-based assessments are completely open-ended, utilize different components of technology and even different subject areas often. And they just take much longer to prepare than a 20 point multiple choice test, which you can make in an hour. Uh, so there are definitely trade-offs uh, right now. And I think it's important that teachers um, educators get started in the standardization of performance-based assessments and creating those frameworks so that uh, other schools and teachers that look towards the future of testing can more easily adopt these different frameworks so that they can bring in the benefits to their students too. Um, so let's talk about what are the challenges. So we've talked about a lot of things you'd like to see changed. What do you acknowledge as the challenges um, that are standing in the way right now? You can start. Um, one of the challenges, I think one of the changes that I want to see in more classrooms and schools right now is diversity and diversity be among uh, the staff in schools. And one of the challenges that I think we will face in order to have that is the encouragement of students, of the future that is coming up. We don't encourage uh, young people that much to, um, how can I put this in <laughs> simple words? We don't encourage uh, students to follow the path that they want, but we encourage them to follow a path that they will be successful in the future that they would um, somehow make it out of the socioeconomic level that they're living right now. And I think that's one of the challenges that we would face, that instead of encouraging them, the students of like thinking about a future, let's think about how can we make our classrooms and the um, workforce more diverse. So we, I would say, me as an immigrant, I can relate to other people. I can relate to that, oh, wait a second, he's the CEO of a company, but he was an immigrant three years ago. He came to the United States three years ago. Wait, if he did it, I can do it. So I think that would be really nice to see in the future, among the future. Yeah, so I agree. <laughs> I really like that answer. Um, and I'd also add that we're seeing, I, I'm gonna go back to the funding point, we're seeing a drop in funding across the nation in public, district, in public school districts um, for a variety of reasons. But that's one of the biggest challenges that we face. I mean, these classes that we're asking for and all of this technology that we're asking for is expensive in all reality. And it's, um, it's hard to get in abundance and it's hard to spread out and decide like okay we have you know this much and we have that many schools like how are we going to distribute this evenly so that every student gets a chance to you know experience using a 3d printer for example or you know other technology that isn't readily available to them outside of school or through you know specialized programs um, so the funding is definitely a big challenge and i think another one that we face is looking for partnerships with like schools, like other schools in higher education around the city. Um, a lot of students like to look for opportunities to take programs at those institutions, um, and but not all students have the time or the capacity to, to do so through their schools. And so I think that there's a lack of partnerships with, um, especially like here in Boston, we have so many new companies that are coming in and the public schools don't have that good of a connection with them. Um, but if we did, students might be able to intern with them or learn from them or go and study and see like what people are working on. So I think that's something that we're missing as well. Yeah. 
Yeah, awesome. Definitely resonate with all those answers. Um, I'm going to take a little more of an unorthodox approach. And uh, this problem probably isn't prevalent everywhere, but I think it's still extremely important to address. And that's the fear of failure. Um, around a decade ago, when the iPads, tablets were first bursting onto the scenes and everyone was on the hype train, uh, this is the new product that's going to revolutionize your classroom because it's finally mature technology, uh, or that, that, that's probably what someone was saying. Uh, and everyone remembers the LAP, uh, the LA Unified Public School District and how they spent $1.3 billion uh, to buy iPads for every single one of their students, and the scandal, the fiasco, and the... Uh, fallout that ensued after that. No one got their iPads. Uh, and I think those type of occasions on, if you look at the hype cycle after the fallout of the very maximum, uh, there's this general apprehension right now among educators and even in the ed tech industry in general of adopting new technologies in fear of having another one of these cases. Um, I think healthy criticism is great. It's extremely important to vet all of these new technologies and come up with the guidelines, come up with standards, and make sure they're actually benefiting students in a tangible way. Uh, but fear of failure and adopting new technology isn't. That's the one thing that's going to be stopping progress, and that can't happen. So let's talk about, in your experience, what your schools have done well. Are there uh, nuggets that you experienced in high school that you can say um, you definitely want to see continue or expand upon? Who wants to start? Stephen's ready. <laughs> great. So uh, the high school that I dropped out of is Cranbrook Schools. Uh, it's a really great private school um, right in Metro Detroit. I was super fortunate to have gotten a scholarship to go there. It's an unbelievable community. Uh, but currently, they are one of the few schools in America right now spearheading a VR, AR program th for adoption throughout their entire educational community, so uh, pre-K all the way through 12th grade. And in some senses, it may sound kind of simple. They're buying a bunch of uh, Google Cardboards, Oculus Rifts, bringing them to the classroom, finding some different curriculum and putting it to use. But in reality, it's much more complicated than that. Uh, they are one of the first to spearhead this innovation. So there's things that you have to do, like come up with completely new guidelines, use cases, curriculum, structure around how t this new technology should impact students in the most beneficial way without any sort of precedent. And that's really hard. Uh, I'm not saying all schools need to approach and go out and buy 30 VR headsets, and most schools probably don't have the funding to do that, but I think it's the initiative that counts. Um, the schools that have those opportunities, I'd like to see more schools take that initiative, and they can do it even creatively by going out and getting grants. But I think that innovation, especially at the school level, is important in driving progress in an increasingly technological advanced society. Um, so at my school, I sort of touched on the pathways earlier, but we do get a chance to sign up for one of our two pathways, and you get to take classes that do specialize in those. So one of them is the what we call the engineering pathway, um, and through your years of high school, you have access to more science classes um, and use of the engineering lab than other students might have, which does put other students at a disadvantage, but it's a good start. Um, to give some students an opportunity to do so or to connect with that technology. Um, at my school is also, we have a lot of like after school opportunities, which are great. Um, for example, our robotics team competes every year and it's a pretty big team, like a lot of people sign up for it every year and they have full um, unlimited access to every piece of technology in our science building and in our engineering lab, which is great. Um, and our school does like, if we need something, we can go to a teacher and say like, hey, we need this or this material. Like, can you help me find a place to get it? And people are super open. So I think that's something great that we're doing. Um, yeah. Can you tell me where your high school name is? Oh, right. Um, I go to the John D. O'Brien. It's in Roxbury. It's the School of Math and Science. And I come from Lowell High School, which is the second largest school in Massachusetts. Um, and one of the things that my school has done great is incorporated, incorporating Generation Citizen into our school. Generation Citizen is an 
organization that works with action civics and incorporates this in the classrooms from middle school through high school. And um, the experience that I took from this, uh, when I was a senior in high school, my class works worked addressing the issue of Islamophobia and how our peers were getting bullied in schools. And at the time, I remember this was a huge uh, boom politically. And we as the students, we were like, yes, we want to take on this. We want to see if we're going to be heard. And we actually got being heard. We changed this so hugely in my school that not, not only the students were stopped getting bullied, but we started a program that the school was saying the Pledge of Allegiance in different languages throughout one and a half years. And after my class, other classes came among, uh, one created a gun buyback that collected 38 guns, unwanted guns, their first year. And they're going to do it now for the third year. Um, another class worked on addressing homelessness and teen hunger. And they opened up a food pantry in the school where the students can just come in, they sign up with their ID and how many items they took from it. And we are, this food pantry is partnered with the Merrimack Food Valley. So the students did all this. They, got in, they communicate with the Merrimack Food Valley. They call them. They make sure how many items they need or what students are taking most from the pantry. And it's actually really cool seeing the students um, just engaging and having the skills of communicating with uh, re their representatives and their local officials on being like, we need this, and you are the person that we need to make it happen. And I, I think that's one thing that my, stu my, my school has done right. I don't think they haven't done anything wrong. And so far, they're including uh, this program in all their, all their uh, social studies classes right now. So it's actually pretty cool. Um, so I am going to open it up to questions soon, so start thinking. Um, in the meantime, I'd like you all, so you, you're sitting in front of a group of people who, um, many of whom have the power to actually make these changes in their schools. So can you talk about what you hope um, people in the audience will take away from this session? Maybe we'll bounce it back to you. Um, one thing that I hope that they get from this session is the fact that um, share with your students, ask uh, your students, or ask the young people in the room, what do you think we're missing? What do you think we need? And can you help us, like, include them in your plans? Because this is something that it will help them uh, in their skills going into college. Because I have uh, friends that when I tell them that I'm going to speak somewhere or that I'm going to talk to my representative or my senator, they're like, are you crazy? Are they going to listen to you? So it, it's something that students now don't realize how important it is. And instead of us being just like having publicity about how important it is to vote, let's start encouraging them, encouraging them to vote, not just uh, having publicity. Like include them in all the things that you want to see change in your school or in your community. Absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, I was actually gonna go along the same lines. I think um, something that we're working on currently in Boston is like uh, putting in teacher evaluations so that students can actively give their teachers evaluations um, and that that feedback actually gets used by the teachers to improve you know, the classroom and the relationship with their students. So for sure. <laughs> um, I think that asking young people like what, again, like what do you see is missing and like what do you need or what do you wanna learn about, that's step like the first step is to find out what we want and what we need and what we see is missing. Um, and I hope, I hope that people take that away is that to go back and ask the young people in your life, like, hey, what do you need from me? Like I have access to this, this and that, or you know, I can find access to this, this and that. How do you, you know, what are you gonna use it for? Like, let's make some change. Awesome. Yep. Uh, I'm going to synthesize my takeaways in three or four main points. So first, education is changing day by day very quickly. I think it's very important for everyone to stay on top of the different trends that are going on, especially in technology. Because when time comes where you need to make those decisive decisions for integration of new products or new tech, uh, you can make the most informed decisions uh, that best drive progress within your school. Second is listen to your students. 
A student's voice in a school is often more powerful than even the staff due to the influence, trust, and honesty they have, that they've built among their peers. And then when you combine that with social media, their voice is only further amplified. Uh, third, experience and hands-on learning is key. The future uh, is going to be filled with problems that are going to be harder than humanity has ever faced before. It's going to be up to our generation to solve those problems. And we should empower our current generation by providing them with the problem-solving opportunities today in school through things like performance-based assessments or even outside uh, things like clubs, involvement, leadership in sports. And uh, fourth and finally, to me, education's future is currently limitless. There are so many great opportunities to be explored that can help benefit our students' future. And there's a lot of work to be done, work that we can all do together. I'm going to end on a Malcolm X quote. Uh, Education is the passport to the future, for tomorrow belongs to those who prepare for it today. I really resonate with this quote. I think it's true. And the future is coming, and we need to prepare for it. Thank you. So anybody have any questions so far? Yep. Let's see if you're loud enough. We don't have to run the mic to you. Yep, so the question is, um, students, what skills that you need and you will need once you get out into the workforce? We don't know what the jobs of tomorrow are. So how, you know, what should we be preparing in you? So you're maybe the farthest away from high school. I'm going to ask what you've experienced so far. I, I would say that uh, really the major one is public speaking and professionalism. And when I say this, is because as being in college right now, you'll be surprised how many young people get so nervous and don't know how to act in front of uh, professionals. And when we get into um, these spaces of professionalism and public speaking, we just think that, oh, I don't know the lingo. Like, what did you say? Is this a new language? It's because we don't learn this in high school. And I'm so glad that I got involved uh, with Generation Citizen and the organization in my classroom because it helped me a lot on, like, public speaking, how to address somebody, um, how do I dress professionally to go to an interview or to a panel like I am right now. And I, I think that's, that would be one of the things that will never change in the workforce when we go out there and the skills that we need. Do you want to go? Um, so I agree as well. And I think students, like, we need, we need life skills. We need to learn life skills while we're still in school. Things like, um, I think Stephen was talking about it earlier, but like financial literacy, um, for sure. And being able, because numbers are always going to be around, right? Numbers aren't going anywhere, especially when it comes to like managing our own household when, like once we get there. So learning how to do that is really important. Um, and other things like civic engagement. Um, it's important to be civically engaged, especially as you know, we're getting to an age where, well, I'm almost at the age where I can vote. But <laughs> um, so you know, being civically engaged and understanding the, the world of politics out there is also super important, and understanding how policy affects you, you know, local policy, national policy, all of that. Um, and last, I think just one of the life skills that I think we need is is how I don't know if there's like a word for it, but we need to learn how to sift through media and information and find the things that are really relevant and those that are not, and understand the world around us, and not necessarily just through the lens of our own opinions and our own interests, but just in general, like what people are seeing and how they're seeing it and how we can really come together to change. Critical thinking skills, I'm gonna name it. Yeah. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> 
Yeah, uh, to me, uh, the number one most important thing is adaptivity. And this is probably traditionally seen as a soft skill, right? Um, but I think it's actually a hard skill, something that can be trained. And there are so many opportunities for a student to uh, increase their adaptive knowledge. Um, and this comes especially in taking advantage of all the resources that school has to provide. We can start inside the classroom where we're providing these students with more challenge-focused, inquiry-based learning where they have to adapt to a problem and utilize and connect different skills together. And there's other opportunities in school too for uh, different events, club involvement, um, all these um, extracurricular per se activities um, for students to adapt and learn about new situations and so that when things like technology are changing rapidly they can go in quickly understand the key points of what they need to grasp to be successful in these new areas and once they've developed that adaptive skill and they're able to quickly think on their feet um, I, I think that's one of the most important skills just going forward and having the adaptivity for any environment and situation. Any other questions? Yep. Uh, yeah, so. Oh. Sorry, the, the video just went off. <clears throat> and for some of you, too. <laughs> Give me one second, okay? Hold on. Okay. Uh, yeah, just wanted to say thanks for sharing. Um, and my question, I guess, is for Carla, but then can open up to everyone. Uh, I really appreciated the way you you explained kind of the tension you felt between being feeling like you had to assimilate to some kind of untraceable idea of the future versus um, feeling like your experience, your community is a source of empowerment. And so from your perspective, which is more important in, in helping you achieve that, that, that feeling that it's a source of empowerment? Is it the, the people involved in the school experience, having teachers and leaders who share that experience? Or do you believe it's the, the content, the, the programs, the curriculum uh, that you study? Um, if you had to choose, which would you feel is, is most important? Does that make sense? Well, thank you for your question. Um, I would say I can't choose between one or the other. I would say it's both. And I was lucky to have a teacher that I, on the per side of um, not comparing to, um, how can I say, to my background, but she has, no, she is a she. She has trouble enough and learn about other countries and other cultures that I can relate to her. And she, she teaches the history in a way that it becomes real for me. She takes the curriculum and she's, she breaks it apart into something that it's an ELL class, but you won't, you, won't feel that, you won't feel that when you're in the class. You will feel like you're in a regular history class where you are with people that shares the same uh, perspective of life that you've been through. But I, I would say that taking the curriculum and having a teacher that you can relate to are the two important things that schools need right now. I, I won't say that I can choose between, between one because I think it goes hand, hands on, hand to head, I would say. You have to figure out how to do it all. You uh, Love that answer. I'd like to put my own spin on it too. Uh, growing up, I always asked myself, why do I need to go to high school? Why do I need to go to college and get a bachelor's degree and confirm to the norm? Um, I was passionate about a lot of different things, and I'm really glad and fortunate to have been able to realize my passion at such an early age today. Um, but that's always been a question that's been going through my mind. And why is there this structure that we have to follow? And then based on your um, uh, the two options, I think um, community is where everything begins. It starts with the people. And uh, like Carla, I was fortunate enough to have a mentor at school um, that understood where I was coming from and was supportive in guiding me along the way. And then once that community is there and you feel like you're in the right environment and you're equipped with that personal uh, environment where people are supportive of you, um, the content comes and follows through after. I think it's uh, a combination of both, but I think it's a sequential progress. 
Uh, we have some other hands up. Run the whole distance. I'll meet you halfway after that. Hi, thank you so much. Um, you've been talking a lot about technology and how it's used for, you know, bringing up those, you know, higher level thinking and how it really brings you to the next level. But in our school, we have a lot of students who are just looking for their next meal. And I was wondering if you see a role for technology for those students and how we can connect with them more. Um, I think I have an, a, a really great example of that. Um, like, how can I say this? <laughs> in my, uh, the high school that I come from, we have a lot of uh, low income students and like, like uh, the gentleman in the back said, a lot of students who are looking, f are thinking about their next meal. And one of the resources that we have at the high school, it's the library where they can come in the morning, it's open at 6 a.m. in the morning and they just come in and do their homework or stuff like that. But what's going on because of the budget, again going to uh, Evelyn talking about the budget, that resource is getting cut out. And a student, the students now are fighting for it and advocating for it to not get it cut out of the school because that's the only resource they have to come in and do their homework when they don't have the money to to afford a computer at home, even though uh, maybe they can go to the public library. But if, at what time they're gonna go to the public library if they have to work, if they have to help their family, if they have to think about what am I gonna do next after school? Oh, after school I have to work, or I have to do this, or I have to do that. So I think one of their resources would be the library and fight for it if it's getting caught in your school, like in my. Yeah, uh, my co-founder Andre can probably explain this a lot better than I can since he actually went through Detroit Public Schools. Um, but uh, early on in the initial development stages of realism, we worked a lot with Detroit Public School students, especially a lot of those underprivileged students that didn't have those resources and were thinking about their next meal. And I think what technology does is it levels the playing field. It brings all those resources that weren't available in the past and puts them in a free way on the internet where anyone can go out and reach for it and devour knowledge and drive their own passions. And that's kind of the path that I kind of went through. I didn't exactly go through school to its finish. And I learned so much just free online through YouTube, through MOOCs, through articles. I think that's really, really powerful. And now today where a lot of students are getting like Chromebooks to take home, they all have their personalized resources where they can go to the library and access these computers all free of access. Um, I think it empowers students in a way that we've never seen before. Uh, I would just echo those slots, yeah. Um, I think that there are infinite resources out there on the internet and when students have a chance to access those at school, that's really, um, you know, that can be really powerful. And schools are asked to do too much, but can we get these kids some food and then give them the technology opportunities that other kids have elsewhere? <laughs> um, so thank you, everybody. Thank you for your questions. Can we give a round of applause to these very insightful, wonderful students? Thank you for joining us. Um, and we're out of time. So. I want to thank everybody for joining us, but before you go, I've got a request for you. Can people raise hands, everybody raise hands who does not have the app? Okay, those of you